My name is Captain Anna Harp uh, and I am a social work officer at uh, One Field Ambulance uh, on CFB Edmonton. A very, very strong, resilient um, client that I had the pleasure of, of working with. He had uh, flashbacks, nightmares, was not able to to function uh, in his family. He came when he uh, he hasn't been sleeping for months, so he came to see us. To, to see us. Um, and after after a course of uh, of some trauma treatment with some wonderful wonderful therapists, he was able to uh, to regain his life and once again reconnect with his family and his wife and his children, and remind them and remind himself how much. Uh, how beautiful his life really is. Um, so it's 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 a great it's a great um, example. But unfortunately, we don't have as many of the same examples. <laughs> so three EMDR hopefully will address that. I did uh, try out the 3MDR. I think it was uh, absolutely mind-blowing. I, I felt so many things I never would have felt in session, in a talk therapy session. Uh, my, mind, my mind, my body, all my senses were activated. I was transported into a world that made me tense. Uh, uh, it, was, it was absolutely mind-blowing. It was remarkable. Um, the fact that the University of Alberta has has graciously opened its doors to, uh, to, to this and, and all the other supporters that are, that are doing this and all the partners. Um, it's, it's really, it's an amazing initiative and it, the, the, the leaders who are doing it, um, it it's really wonderful. And, and I genuinely hope that it will uh, light a fire in, 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 this, in, this, or in our organization and, and nationally. There's definitely a need uh, out there, and the potential is 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 extraordinary. And I hope this is only the beginning. Good evening, and welcome to Ground Zero: Building Resilience When the Unthinkable Happens. I'm Andrew Sharman, Vice President of Facilities and Operations at the University of Alberta. Dr. David Turpin, our 13th President and Vice Chancellor, apologizes that he was unable to be here with us this evening. The University of Alberta acknowledges that we are located on Treaty 6 territory and respects the histories, languages, and cultures of First Nations, Métis, Inuit, and all First Peoples of Canada, whose presence continues to enrich our vibrant community. On behalf of the University of Alberta and Heroes in Mind Advocacy and Research Consortium, thank you very much for joining us this evening. As a former member of the British Army, it's a real privilege for me to be able to attend this special event today. Highmark, the Heroes in Mind Advocacy and Research Consortium, creates partnerships and coordinates efforts to benefit those who serve us, Canadian military, veterans, public safety personnel and their families. HIMARC's founding members include the Faculty of Rehabilitation Medicine, the Royal Canadian Legion, Alberta Northwest Territories Command, the Northern Alberta Institute of Technology, the Canadian Armed Forces, Glenrose Rehabilitation Hospital, the Department of National, Offense, National Defense, Veterans Affairs Canada, Alberta Health Services and Covenant Health. Simply put, Highmark is made up of individuals and organizations who want to serve those in uniform, those who have served us, 
and those that continue to serve us daily. To do so, Highmark brings together the best and brightest partners to benefit serving military, veterans, public safety personnel and their families through research, education and treatment across Alberta and beyond. They aim to lead efforts provincially to highlight and promote Alberta-based innovations, expertise and resources. And ultimately, create a centre of resilience excellence to empower individuals and their families so that they thrive amidst life's circumstances. Tonight, we have a great opportunity to learn about resilience from our keynote speaker, Alice M. Greenwald, President and CEO of the 9-11 Memorial and Museum in New York. Now I'd like to invite Martin Ferguson Pell, Professor from the University of Alberta Faculty of Rehabilitation Medicine and member of Highmark to come up and introduce our special guest, Martin. Good evening and thank you, Andrew. Our keynote uh, lecture is presented by Alice M. Greenwald, and her lecture will provide the backdrop to a special panel discussion where we'll hear from associates of Highmark. They've served in the military or as first responders or represent the perspectives of family members. Our goal is, is, is to ex examine how we will respond when unthinkable events occur in society as a whole or to the lives of individuals. This evening, we're interested in learning how our communities can provide appropriate support and empathy. We'd also like to take the discussion one step further in asking how either major events such as 9-11 or individual experiences carry over and affect the resilience of the next generation and beyond. So let's get started. Alice M. Greenwald has been immersed in the creation of the National September 11th Memorial and Museum in New York City since 2006. Ms. Greenwald is president and CEO of the museum, a position she's held since 2017. From 2006 to 2017, Ms. Greenwald was director of the Memorial Museum, executive vice president for ex exhibitions, collections, and educations at the 9-11 Museum. From 2001 to 2006, Ms. Greenwald was the associate museum director, museum programs at the United States Holocaust Museum in Washington, DC, having served for the previous 14 years as an expert advisor to the project. Ms. Greenwald serves on a number of advisory boards in the United States and UK. She holds an MA in the history of religions from the University of Chicago Divinity School, and a BA with concentrations in English literature and anthropology from Sarah Lawrence College. Ms. Greenwald, welcome to Edmonton. Please come on up. Good evening. And thank you, Martin, Andrew, everyone who's been part of this um, fascinating day that we've had and um, what I hope will be a very, very um, interesting and insightful panel. Um, you know, when Martin asked me if I would um, speak, uh, I said, I don't know that I'm a, an expert on resilience, um, but I can be an expert on the process it took to create a memorial and a museum at Ground Zero. Uh, which I think is in the business of creating resilience, although I would never have necessarily spoken of it in those terms. So um, think of this as a case study, if you will. So 18 years ago, the unthinkable happened. Wherever we were that day, we knew that our world, our sense of history had been altered. There would now forever be a before 9-11 and an after 9-11. America's presumed invulnerability from terrorist attacks, the, th the sense that things happened elsewhere, but not there, had been shattered. We lost friends, coworkers, and family. We grieved for strangers. We reeled in shock. We came together to pray and to mourn. We cheered those who met the challenge of rescue and recovery. And we re reaffirmed our resilience and our resolve. 
and we chose to commemorate and rebuild. The 9-11 memorial opened in 2011 on the 10th anniversary of the attacks. The museum followed three years later, and since then, more than 48 million people have paid their respects at the memorial, and over 16 million have visited the museum. They continue to come from all over the world, many staying three hours or more to remember, to encounter, and to experience an understanding of the unimaginable. Situated at the very heart of a revitalized World Trade Center site, the 9-11 Memorial and Museum is first and foremost a sacred place. It will forever be inextricably woven into the fabric of our city and our nation. It is a place of pilgrimage and comfort, a refuge for remembrance. This is true for victims' family members, survivors, responders, recovery and relief workers, and the thousands of visitors who come here every day to learn about the horrors of the attacks and the extraordinary and heroic efforts that followed. But the 9-11 Memorial and Museum also offers an opportunity to contemplate the future, taking stock of where we've been and where we're headed. Already, the Memorial and Museum has demonstrated an unequaled power to convene and to provide a unique platform from which to address the most consequential issues of our time. It is a safe place from which to confront difficult history. It is a reminder of what's at stake. We've received accolades and awards for our architecture and our exhibitions. Last year, in fact, and I will tell you, I burst out laughing when I got this email, TripAdvisor's Traveler's Choice Awards named us the best museum in America and number two in the world. I thought it was a joke, honestly. Um, but I had to ask myself why. We believe that this museum's power is rooted in certain key principles that informed its creation, and that's what I'm going to discuss with you this evening. In the museum's earliest planning phases, those charged with the responsibility of envisioning this institution understood it to be as much sacred as cultural. With work on the museum's exhibition starting barely five years after the attacks, the planning team, museum leaders and advisors, curators, educators and historians, designers and architects, recognized that this museum had to provide a means for processing the experience of 9-11 and for facilitating the grief we all had to go through as individuals, as citizens of New York City and the nation, and as members of a world community. There were certain key assumptions that guided our approach. The museum had to be first about remembering the victims, honoring those who went to their rescue, recognizing the survivors, and paying tribute to those who responded with selfless devotion and dedication during the recovery. It needed to communicate the absolute illegitimacy of indiscriminate murder and it would have to attest emphatically to the unacceptability of terrorism as a response to any grievance, political or otherwise. We recognize that there was a sense in which the 9-11 story was about great buildings that had been destroyed, that we were mourning their loss as well. But we knew that our story could not primarily be about buildings except insofar as the towers themselves had come to represent something iconic or culturally specific, something inherently symbolic. With great humility, we acknowledged that our job, for the moment at least, could not be to attempt to graft historical meaning onto the events. To be sure, the attacks would have to be placed in historical context within this museum. 9-11, after all, did not happen in a vacuum. But we instinctively understood that we could not produce a museum that would present this history as a conclusive lesson of some kind. The story of 9-11 was and is still evolving, its repercussions still unfolding. There is no ending as yet to this story. It would have been completely presumptuous to be prescriptive or didactic about the historical lessons of 9-11. It was simply way too soon. And so we followed a different path. 
The character of a visit to this museum would be, for the foreseeable future, an individual experience of meaning making within a communal setting, a process informed by each person's particular associations with the events. Anticipating that a vast majority of our visitors had lived through an event estimated to have been witnessed by two billion people, that was one third of the world's population in 2001. We knew that many would bring their own memories of that day to the museum. We recognize that one of the great opportunities of this museum would be its ability to become a place where those memories could be affirmed, preserved, and integrated into the larger narrative it would contain. And yet, already, after only five years of operation, and as we now approach the 20th anniversary of 9-11 in just less than two years away, there is a new generation coming through our doors with no personal memories of 9-11. Some of them are already in college. Others are beginning their careers. The Memorial and Museum has to be meaningful for them as well. Almost immediately after the 9-11 attacks, it was understood to be the day the world changed. And the world has changed. This generation, born in the shadow of 9-11, the post-9-11 generation, faces challenges most of us and most of our children never knew growing up. They were born into a world where terrorism is quite simply a fact of life. They are living in a world increasingly defined by widespread intolerance and an absence of civility, endless war, and the ever-present threat of mass shootings and other forms of violence in public places, spaces once considered safe, like schools, hotels, concert halls, and places of worship. They experience a world in which extreme security measures are now the norm, fear is pervasive, and bigotry is promoted on social media and modeled by individuals in positions of leadership and authority. It is a difficult world to make sense of, whether you experience 9-11 or not. Someone recently observed, standing at the site of the 9-11 Memorial and Museum at what was once called Ground Zero, that the 21st century started here, at this place. And so visitors of all ages come to the memorial and the museum, not only as an act of pilgrimage to pay respects, they're coming to understand this complex, often baffling, and ever-evolving world in which we live. The process of envisioning the 9-11 Memorial Museum took eight years and involved a host of participants, curators, educators, exhibition developers, architects, landmark preservationists, representatives of various constituencies, among them family members of victims, survivors of the attacks, first responders, former recovery workers, and lower Manhattan residents and business owners, all with a vested interest in what this museum should present and the exhibition designers and media producers charged with translating all of the various imperatives into a meaningful experience. All museums that document events defined by unimaginable personal loss and collective trauma will inevitably face challenges. The 9-11 Memorial Museum was no exception. The work to create this museum took place within the context of intense public scrutiny, divergent expectations of what would be appropriate to present as such an emotionally charged site, and the daunting responsibility to construct an exhibition narrative that would effectively codify a history not yet written. Among the core issues was how to balance commemoration with education, historical documentation, and the presence of information that is both graphic and provocative. Adding to these complications were our temporal proximity to the event itself, the fact that key constituencies remain traumatized by grief, both personal and communal, and the extremely public and at times politicized planning process for a museum commemorating an event at once highly local, distinctly national, and essentially global. 
At every step, the design team had to negotiate each of these challenges and considerations. And consequently, every choice we made in putting this museum together, which objects and recordings to include, whether or not to reference the hijackers, how to handle incredibly sensitive material and subject matter, including disturbingly explicit imagery, all of that was deliberated over, debated, and interrogated from every angle, including a careful consideration of our visitors' emotional thresholds. In addition, we had to create an experience that would make sense within a setting of palpable authenticity. The 9-11 Museum is not simply located at the site of the attacks. It is seven stories below ground in a space defined by in situ historic remnants. Because federal preservation law mandated that those remnants be accessible to the public, the museum was built in a contemporary archeological site whose authenticity of place had to be fully integrated with the narrative that would unfold within it. We saw this as an advantage rather than a challenge. Where most museums are buildings that house artifacts, this would be a museum housed within an artifact. In speaking about this project during the planning phase, people would regularly use words like challenging and controversial. And when they did, I would always quote historian Edward Linenthal, who has said that, and I quote him now, controversy is not necessarily a bad thing. Rather, it is evidence of passion on all sides. And surely, there was no shortage of passion when it came to this project. Ours were particular kinds of challenges, however, challenges both unique to the event we were commemorating and also to some degree increasingly typical of public building projects dedicated to memorializing events defined by unimaginable personal loss as well as collective trauma. Ultimately, four key principles informed the 9-11 Memorial Museum's fundamental character. The first of these is authenticity. At sites of memory, authenticity is the critical element for achieving moral authority. Our location at Ground Zero, in the presence of the archeological remnants of the original World Trade Center, reinforced this value and demanded that we focus on what happened here at this site. Establishing the authenticity of our narrative was a first order of business. As an educational inst institution, our commitment has been to the narration of fact-based history. The museum strives to establish a level of literacy about the historical context for the events of September 11th, the nature of the world in which we live, the reality of terrorism, and the often incompatible political forces that remain in tension with one another. This tragedy was not the result of a natural disaster. 9-11 was planned and carried out by human beings. In the end, we did not shy away from including the recorded voices of the perpetrators, nor did we fail to include the historical context in which Al-Qaeda arose, the primary participants in its evolution, and the names and faces of those who plotted and carried out the attacks. In the effort to address who did this and why, we consulted scholars, historians, and experts in various fields to locate the artifacts, images, and content that could most effectively and accurately tell this story. Authenticity is communicated at the very start of the museum journey. After visitors enter the museum pavilion, they pass two 80-foot high columns known as tridents that were originally on the east face of the North Tower, the original One World Trade Center. These columns formed the perimeter structure of the first five stories of the Twin Towers. From outside the museum, the tridents signal the power and presence of the authentic artifacts inside. Within the museum atrium, visitors can now look beyond them to see the new One World Trade Building, suggesting a sense of continuity between past and present. The authentic can be embodied by objects, location, or the voice of historic witness. We used all three to shape the visitor experience. Artifacts ranging from the monumental to the intimate connect visitors to the physical scale of both the site 
and the disaster, as well as the human scale of experience and loss. Our location at the heart of the original World Trade Center invites visitors to enter into history, both physically and metaphorically. Here, the voices of those who experienced the events, whether in the buildings, on the hijacked planes, or as witnesses, provide an immediacy of connection. And connection is, in fact, the second principle. A memorial, a memorial museum should facilitate a sense of connection with those who suffered an atrocity or a social injustice, whether as victims, survivors, or witnesses. It is essential that visitors see themselves in the story you are telling. This is true even for the post 9-11 generation. The stories told at this museum have to resonate for all. At the museum, the heart of our story is about the people most directly affected by this event. From the start of planning, we recognize that a core responsibility of the museum is to undercut the very presumption of terrorism, that victims of such acts, in this case, mostly civilians who neither signed up for active combat, nor were they on that terrible morning in any way aware of the grave threat facing them, become nameless abstractions. The museum worked with families, friends, and colleagues of the victims, as well as partners like the Voices of September 11th and StoryCorps, to secure as much material as possible about every individual killed, so that our visitors could be introduced to these people, not by us curators and museum creators, but by the people who knew and loved them. In the 9-11 Memorial Museum, we want to remember people for how they lived, not just for how they died. And in this sacred space, the number 2,983 is never an abstraction. The message we strive to convey is this. The people killed on 9-11 could have been any one of us, arriving at work or boarding a plane one morning. They were ages two and a half to 85, from more than 90 nations, representing a wide diversity of economic sectors, ethnicities, and faith traditions. In deliberately focusing throughout the Memorial Museum on the individuality of these people, we aspire to fulfill the mandate of remembrance at contemporary rem memorials, which again, in the words of historian Ed Linenthal, is all too often an act of protest against the anonymity of mass death in our time. This principle of connection also directly informed the design of our introductory exhibition, which we call We Remember. It's estimated, as I said earlier, that one third of the world's population, nearly two billion people, watched the events of, on 9-11, on the day of 9-11, simultaneously, either as they unfolded in real time or during the endlessly repeating broadcasts that afternoon and evening. Those of us who lived through that day are in some sense experts in this subject matter based on our own experiences and our own memories. In We Remember, instead of having a conventional curatorial voice describing the global experience of 9-11, we invite our visitors to hear what it was like from real people speaking with the authority of their own experience. As visitors move toward a global map that fractures into six panels, they listen to people from around the world remembering where they were when they first heard about the events happening in New York. Hearing memories spoken in 28 languages, visitors enter into a human drama that feels at once universal and deeply personal as they are pulled forward into both the physical space of the museum and the narrative space of the story. Which brings us to the next principle, which is storytelling. The 9-11 Museum's dynamic blend of architecture, archaeology, history, and commemoration creates an indelible encounter with the story of the attacks and their aftermath. The experience reminds visitors that history is not an abstraction, but rather a compilation of lived narratives that weave into collective memory. As a storytelling museum, our focus is not so much on historians' interpretation of history, but rather on the human experience 
of a historical event. At the heart of this museum is this fundamental conviction that bearing witness to the unimaginable is the only way to imagine a way beyond it. The museum's two core exhibitions are located at Bedrock, allowing visitors to be in the very spaces where the Twin Towers once stood. In memoriam, the memorial exhibit I just uh, mentioned and you just saw on the screen, is located on the actual footprint of the South Tower. The historical exhibition, located on the North Tower footprint, examines the day of the attacks, what preceded them, and how 9-11 continues to shape our world. In the historical exhibition, we make use of all forms of new media in the service of storytelling. Voicemail messages, emails, cockpit voice recordings, and radio transmissions provide an unparalleled sense of being inside the story. In intimate spaces called audio alcoves, visitors listen to first-person accounts of escape and evacuation and radio transmissions from first responders. Among the most sensitive recordings are real-time messages and calls to 911 from those trapped within the buildings. And in the Flight 93 alcove, voicemail messages left for loved ones by passengers and crew members aboard the hijacked flight. Our use of these clips demanded very careful consideration of our visitors' emotional tolerances. When is listening to a recording of someone's final words in the public space of a museum appropriate? When does historical documentation violate individual dignity and privacy? These questions were at the heart of every decision we made. The fourth and final principle is engagement. A museum dedicated to commemoration and education cannot merely testify to what happened. It must also provide inspiration and the opportunity for response. The 9-11 Memorial Museum is transactional in support of the transformational. It invites visitors to look back in order to look forward. In telling the story of the recovery at Ground Zero, for example, we not only track the nine months it took to search for human remains and ultimately to clear millions of tons of debris from the site, we tell the equally important story of 912. Epitomized by acts of public service and volunteerism that significantly contributed to the cleanup and recovery efforts. That spirit of generosity, born of shared grief and a fundamental recognition of shared humanity, becomes a model for how to live in an interconnected world. When visitors exit the historical exhibition, they arrive in an enormous space called Foundation Hall. At its center is the 36-foot-high last column, the very last piece of Twin Tower steel to be removed from the World Trade Center at the end of the recovery period in May 2002. Covered with messages, missing posters, mass cards, and memorabilia, this totem of recovery was brought out of the site on a flatbed truck, covered in a shroud, itself covered by an American flag, and escorted by honor guard. Here, inside the museum, it stands tall again. Providing the dramatic backdrop is a monumental portion, 60 feet high by 60 feet wide, of the slurry wall, the original retaining wall built to hold back the Hudson River when the World Trade Center was first under construction in the late 1960s. On 9-11, as 1.8 million tons of debris crashed into the site, the slurry wall was severely challenged. Had it breached, the disaster in Lower Manhattan would have been even more unimaginable. The subway tunnels would have flooded, Lower Manhattan would have been inundated. But the wall held. And in holding, the slurry wall has become, excuse me, I think I'm in, no, second. I think I've gone too far. Go back a minute. All right. In holding, the slurry wall has become a symbol of strength, fortitude, resilience, and endurance. 
Here in the museum, it is both a literal foundation of what once was here and a metaphoric foundation for what we now can build. In this memorial museum set within the foundations of the World Trade Center, at the epicenter of Ground Zero, we can begin to imagine together the kind of world we want to build for the generations that will follow us. When you look it up in the dictionary, Ground Zero has multiple meanings. It can be used to describe the epicenter or site of a cataclysm, a disaster, much as the World Trade Center was on and immediately after 9-11. It can, you know what, I'm off completely here and I apologize, I seem to be, it seems to be, not. let me just check, okay. Those two slides were juxtaposed, I'm sorry they were out of order. Um, Ground Zero can also reference a site of intense change, which was true of the World Trade Center site during both the recovery, the nine months of recovery, and the rebuilding efforts of the past 18 years. For those of you who have uh, not been in New York recently, Lower Manhattan is extraordinary. I mean, you've got new office towers, a beautiful new transportation hub, um, you know, the Memorial and Museum at the heart of it, but it is totally rebuilt and incredibly vibrant. Um, so the second definition was certainly the ground zero we've experienced over the last 18 years. But ground zero can also suggest a starting point a place of infinite possibility. In 2015, Pope Francis chose the 9-11 Memorial Museum's Foundation Hall for a multi-religious meeting for peace. His gathering was intended to be aspirational and inspiring, an affirmation of the values of 9-12, a starting point. Pope Francis was animating this third definition of ground zero. He was intentionally and actively changing the valence of the charged history of this site to promote a vision of a different kind of world where religious differences would not be a source of hatred and a source of violence, but reflect instead our shared humanity. As a living memorial, we too can promote the idea of Ground Zero being a starting place where the literal foundations of the original World Trade Center become metaphoric foundations for building a better world, a world defined by values like courage, selflessness, resolve, resilience, compassion, empathy, and acceptance, values demonstrated on the day of the attacks and in the days and weeks and months that followed them. Changing the valence of ground zero does not mean that we stop remembering what happened at this site. It means using remembrance as a lens through which others can begin to see the possibility of the world Pope Francis was trying to envision, a future that feels more like 912 than it does like the post 911 world. And so on their way out of the museum, our visitors move toward an escalator that will take them up from bedrock and as they do that, they pass a final piece of World Trade Center steel. Next to it are kiosks where they can sign their names, make an observation, or voice a promise. The words they write appear on a map projected onto an adjacent area of the slurry wall. Their names and words emerge from where that person comes from. So if Martin were to write, always remember, it would appear to be coming out of Edmonton, Alberta. This map is the very same map visitors saw at the head of the ramp, the global map that fractured on the morning of 9-11. But here, the map is coherent and whole once again. And what's holding it together are all of us and the promises we make. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alice. And we have a wonderful opportunity now for you to ask some questions of Alice and uh, to get a perspective from Alice on some of the things that must have been on your minds for all of those years since this happened. So um, who would like to get started? We have someone with a mic who will run across and um, give you the opportunity to ask a question. 
Is there someone? There must be a question. <laughs> well, oh, there we go. Yeah, one right here. Right, right here, um, Laurie. Sorry. Yep, it's it's uh, Karen Ball. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Um, I was just wondering, having been to the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum a few times, uh, you know, there's a space there for exhibits that look at the present from the standpoint of what happened in the Holocaust. Um, and so there's an opportunity for a critical reflection there. And I was just curious about this museum if, um, you know, I'm a dual citizen, so I have issues with the current government in the U.S. <laughs> so do I. <laughs> I. So I'm just curious about how far you go, you know, because there's so many things that happened, you know, government policies that, uh, you know, affected Canada as well, like the, Arar, the extraordinary rendition of Arar, among others. And I was just wondering if there's any attempt to bear witness to some of these highly politicized uh, issues? Yeah, you know, I mean, it's a great question. And um, we, here's, here's the challenge, you know, at the, the Holocaust Museum in Washington, um, they have a, a founding mandate to um, use the experience, the history of the Holocaust as a way to um, foster genocide prevention, genocide awareness, genocide prevention. Um, there is no way we're going to prevent terrorism at this museum. There's, you know, there's much less that they're not going to prevent genocide either. Apparently, the Holocaust Museum, but it does. It is about um, on our watch how we respond. Um, we deal with some very difficult, sensitive, um, contemporary issues, but it's always in the context of the history we tell. So we do a lot of public programming around um, ISIS and the uh, consequences of the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, you know the. Uh, uh, metastasis of Al Qaeda into ISIS and other forms of, you know, of terrorist activity. We look at the dynamics of diplomacy. We look at the hotspots around the world. So we do address these things on a regular basis. We also look at um, a very sensitive issue, which is the experience of Muslim Americans after 9/11, which has not been a pretty picture, and it has only gotten worse. And um, we had a program uh, not that long ago with a wonderful um, speaker, Harun Mogul, who um, happened to have been the head of the Muslim um, student group at NYU on 9/11, and um, that day was a you know a, a marker for him of you know the before part of his life and the after part of his life, and um, he talks about uh, how he's tried to reconcile his sense of American identity with his identity as a Muslim and how that has not been an easy task after 9-11. So we do take on those highly sensitive topics, um, primarily in public programming, uh, because that gives us a dynamic environment in which to explore the questions, listen to experts who've thought about it, written about it, and also engage our, our audience. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you. I think Reg has a question. question. Sure. Thank you very much uh, for coming to Edmonton, and thank you very much for the museum. I had the opportunity to visit uh, the museum with my family this summer. Wonderful. Um, your desire to span generations um, worked. Good. <laughs> um, the ability to touch my children, who are both post 9 11 um, born, um, I could not relate the story to them, you know. And so what hit them was the the recordings, yeah. and. My daughter said to me, she says, well, he sounds like you, dad. He's a business guy like you, right? He connected to her. Yeah. That this were just yes. regular people doing their everyday things. Exactly. So it really did touch them. It was moving. Thank you. My question is, um, that was really moving and touching, and I think it connected, and which is one of your goals, of course. The process you said was challenging in terms of, well, not challenging, but you went through a very rigorous process in terms of determining how and when. Curious to know a little bit more about that in terms of, did you have to do consultation with the surviving families? Can you expand a little bit sure. on that process? Sure, yes. Um, uh, we did have to do consultation. And um, you know, you're dealing with family members of nearly 3,000 people. So exponentially, talking about you know, uh, 
close family members that you could be talking about 10 or 11,000 people. So we did not talk to every one of them. Um, but we had a, a very elaborate process, uh, which was called the Museum Planning Conversation Series, um, which involved representatives of all of the different constituencies. So it was family members of victims, we had first responders, we had survivors, um, we had recovery workers, relief workers, volunteers, lower Manhattan residents, we had political representatives. We, I mean, it just went, the list went on and on. It was about 90 people in the room. Um, and um, we started with a series of programs um, in 2006, so this is five years after 9-11, uh, where we didn't know yet what museum we were going to build. We, there was no way to know. So we talked about what museums do. And we talked about um, how you deal with traumatic history and where this fit in the American historical narrative and museums as um, performance spaces, performance in the anthropological sense of the term, of places where you perform um, learning in a communal um, environment. Uh, and we had experts from various fields come in. And what that did was um, it created a kind of level playing field where um, most people in the room had never thought about any of those issues. It was just not part of their um, experience. And, and so suddenly they were all talking the same language about the opportunity we had with creating this museum. These were the things we would have to think about. And um, that was very useful. And then throughout the eight year process of creating the museum, we would go back to the same group, which evolved over time. Different people would come in and out. But um, we would show design studies. We would. Um, bring them along with our challenges. You know, this we're troubled by this and we don't know if we can do this and we would get their feedback. And initially, I would say there was a great deal of deference on the part of the people in the room to family members of victims. They had lost loved ones. How could I feel like my perspective is more important than their perspective? And that lasted for a period of time and then the others got their voice. And, um, and it was a very dynamic process. We actually made... Um, some big changes as a result of that dialogue, you know, because uh, from a exhibition planning, curatorial point of view, we thought we knew what we were doing. And then you'd get the feedback that, well, you know, that's not working for me and I'm one of your primary constituents. So, you know, we had to engage in that kind of dialogue and it, it really, it made an enormous difference. The, um, the blue wall that you uh, saw in some of the pictures there, um, um, and I don't want to talk too long because I know we want to get to the, the panel, but um, the, uh, one of the great challenges of this project is the fact that um, located on the premises is a repository of human remains um, managed, owned, operated by the uh, chief medical examiner of the city of New York. And just so you understand what that is about, um, the physical nature of the collapses of these two 110-story buildings essentially meant that people were pulverized in the collapse. And to this day, 18 years after 9-11, 40% of the families who lost loved ones in New York have received nothing of their loved ones. So the medical examiner does have a, a repository of um, uh, about 8,000 human remains. Um, they continue to use increasingly precise DNA analysis and other forensic methods to try to make positive identifications. And there have been two medical examiners since 9-11, both of them have pledged that this will go on in perpetuity, that they will not stop until they have done this. And every once in a while in the New York papers, you'll read a positive identification was made. Um, but this is a repository, it's not a mausoleum. It's, it's, they go in and out of it, I don't, it's not part of the museum. But there is a single wall that demarcates the public space of the museum from the medical examiner's repository. And we knew um, that our audience, Americans, are a little uncomfortable with death, with the you know, with any kind of real encounter with death. It's not like you go to you know St. Paul's. Uh, cathedral in London and the Crypt Cafe is next to the Crypts, you know, and which it is. Um, complete comfort level there. Um, but we didn't have that going in and we knew this would be very difficult for people, you know, for everybody. And um, so we made the decision to try to do something 
uh, with that wall that would um, help mediate this reality for our visitors. It also, unfortunately, in the way the architecture of the museum was designed, it is where you literally arrive when you've gone down the seven stories, down this ramp, to bedrock. You're there. You're standing. It's like not the punchline of the story. It's the beginning of the story. So we really had to think that one through. And um, fairly early on, we found a quote um, uh, from Virgil's Aeneid, um, no day shall erase you from the memory of time, which we thought was the perfect quote for that space. And our designer had this brilliant idea to um, engage a an artisan blacksmith in New Mexico by the name of Tom Joyce to take remnant steel from the World Trade Center and reforge it into the letters of the quote. And in the refiring of the steel, it turns this beautiful iridescent blue. And, and it's all about transformation through memory, which is what the museum is all about. So we thought, we nailed this. We got this design. This is it. We bring it to our group of consulting parties. And um, they look at it. They love the quote, love the steel. And then the family members would come up to us and said, but you know what? It's sitting on a really ugly, raw concrete wall. Because we're in an archaeological site. We're not putting granite up on the wall. And, and they said, you know, if my loved one is behind that wall, it needs to be distinguished in some way other than with these letters and words. It needs to be special. Can't look like the rest of the place. And we're like, OK. So, we didn't know what to do, and we looked at many, 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 many design studies. Nothing was right. And ultimately, one of our advisors said, the only thing that will work here is a work of art. So we put out a call, an invitational. We had seven, we went to seven artists. Four of them said, no, thank you. Don't want anything to do with it. Three of them came back with designs. We picked one artist to work with, Spencer Finch, who happens to be based in Brooklyn, New York. And Spencer came up with this idea of a devotional act on his part of hand painting 2,983, the number of people we commemorate at this site, 2,983 hand painted watercolor squares. And they had to be paper, they couldn't be ceramic, because it was paper that fell from the buildings and it was paper that were the missing posters and he wanted it to live in real time. And he hand painted each of these tiles using a spectrometer to make sure that the tint of blue would be different for each panel of these nearly 3,000 papers, these 3,000 watercolors. He puts it up on the wall surrounding the Virgil quote. And um, what you have is a unified field of blue made up of completely unique individual components. All of these people that we are commemorating were co connected forever by the circumstances of their death. But we cannot ever forget that each was a unique individual. And then he turned it back on us, the viewer, and he titled the piece, Trying to Remember the Color of the Sky on that September morning. So my memory of that intensely clear blue sky may not be the same as Martin's memory of it or your memory of it, but we all have the obligation to remember. So it was, in the end, the perfect thing to do. But getting there literally took years. Fascinating. One more question, and yes. Um, say that again. Oh, OK. Um, well, as you can imagine, when you're dealing with um, traumatic history and traumatic memory, uh, it does have an impact on the people who are most closely working with the, the material. So for example, um, I'm sitting at my desk. I'm dealing with personnel matters. I'm you know, working with the budget and the board. And I'm pretty far away on a day-to-day -day basis from the content. Our oral historians, by contrast, are sitting in studios seven hours a day listening to people recount their histories. They are on the front lines of the emotional intensity of this topic. Um, so we have been very um, careful to provide 
uh, you know, outlets for them if they need it through our personnel office, our HR office, that there are ways that they can get help if they feel overwhelmed. Um, but I will tell you something. Um, in traumatic history, and I saw this at the Holocaust Museum, and I've seen it here, almost every day you hear a story about the other side of human experience, how people responded to one another. Um, strangers who stood with strangers in a stairwell um, because one of them couldn't walk down and the other who didn't even know them said, I'm staying with you. Um, you know, uh, the responders, um, just in incredible um, human beings who knew what they were going up to and knew they wouldn't be coming back and they went up. Um, you know, uh, stories of um, how people responded after 9-11. There are lots of ways to respond. And so many people chose to help. You know, how can I be of service? What can I do? So many people uh, came out of the experience of 9-11 and um, went into public service in one way or another, whether they joined the army or they went into the intelligence agencies to do something as, as a form, the diplomacy as a form of public service. You had people um, creating foundations, uh, family members of victims creating foundations um, to do good in the world. And um, this is very much part of what you learn, is that we ultimately cannot help bad people from doing bad things. If they have the means and the methods and the motivation to do harm, sometimes they will succeed. You know, uh, Margaret Thatcher used to say, you know, um, we have to be right all the time. They, uh, you know, wait, how did she put it? Um, well, it was along the lines of, you know, somebody who's going to do harm, they only have to be right once. Right? We have to be protecting ourselves constantly. They only have to get what they're after once. Um, so we may not be able to prevent that. It's part of human existence that these horrible things are going to happen. We can try to prevent them, and God knows, you know, law enforcement and um, intelligence are doing incredible work. The only thing we actually have control over is how we respond to these events when they happen. And that tells us what we are capable of as human beings. So when you hear these stories on a day-to-day -day basis, despite hearing the horrific stories, you also hear these elevating stories. And that's what fires you up and gives you the courage to keep going day after day, because that's what matters, is reminding ourselves we're capable of being better human beings. It shouldn't take an event like 9-11 to remind us of how we should behave. Alice, thank you so much. That was wonderful. So our other panelists will join us in a second. I'm going to get my notes. Alice, thank you so much for your kind words and your, um, your reflective words and challenging words to invite us to think beyond ourselves and to go on a journey with you through the collective creation and co-creation of something that was so memorable to commemorate um, the events that happened that really changed the world and changed our vision. Um, I think, you know, when I, when I ponder about um, what Highmark is, Highmark is an institute to be able to help us, um, help those who serve us and to journey with, uh, with them, with members that have gone through times of struggle that offer their lives in service for all of us, to support all of us, and to think about what they offer us and what challenges they place before us to commemorate what they've gone through um, in their stories, in their journeys, both individually and collectively. As I was pondering about the words that you were leaving us with, there were a whole bunch of C words that kept popping up for me. Um, be that one of thinking about casting vision with conviction where you spoke about having to think about, with intentionality, um, what happened and what changed the world. And with courage to step into those places, not just of the experience of others, but the, but the courage to take a look with authenticity 
and with character and to look at changing that balance um, from what, what was so horrific to something about 912. And being able to embrace that with people and to engage in a community of engagement where we could, you could, co-create something new that could change culture, that could really be transformative. And those key words that you utilize to be able to personally embrace that suffering with courage. And not just the suffering, but the strength. And to have that lens of being able to look at the beauty of the human spirit and the courage to step forward and to be transformed um, and self-implicated in that whole process. What an incredible, incredible journey and feat. And to not do that individually, but to do that as a collective in order to be able to change culture, to look at our common humanity and to look at how there is a common good that each of us is striving towards. Something so rich and so beautiful about our collective responsibility to commemorate, to remember, and to co-create going forward so that we can co-transform um, and pick up the rubble and look at the pieces that build something moving forward. That co-creation and that deep, profound commitment to change culture and to remember the contextualization that needs to happen so that every person individually in those shades of blue, in those cultures that are all represented in that in that mosaic and in that tapestry is so represented and so remembered and commemorated with distinction. The beauty that you have done, Alice, with your community around you has been extraordinary. So I just want to thank you. Yeah. Thank you. When I think about the work that Highmark is doing, we too want to lean into those pieces to remember those who serve and those who have served us, and to remember their stories, their sacrifice, your sacrifices, your commitment, your cultures, your pieces, your contexts, and to remember that we have a collective responsibility to take care of those who serve us. That is the heart and the authenticity. You know, Alice spoke of character and the deep commitment of that changing balance, what it takes to be authentic, to journey alongside, to go into those places that others don't want to go, into the suffering and the struggle of our, of our shared common humanity, and to celebrate what has been challenged, but also what is the possibility and the potential, and to keep our eyes on the strength of what each person gives, and have hope for the future, and have hope for what is possible. Highmark is about possibility. Highmark is about potential. Highmark is about looking at how we might be able to stand beside and prepare people for the unthinkable, to be able to build people and enable communities and individuals to be as strong as they possibly can be, to support those who serve us and to, su to support those in service so that we together can create a common humanity and a common good going forward. We also are there to be able to provide courage and hope and care for those that have gone through struggles, through research, teaching, and service, to be able to enable them to be resilient before, during, and after their service and their time so that they can continue to serve in the way that they want to. And to remind us that we have a common collective um, resource and expertise to be able to bring to bear on those different circumstances that people have lived through. It's my commitment as the director of Highmark to be able to position us, to be able to leverage the resources, the expertise within our province and beyond, and our world, to be able to bring to bear um, the expertise that we have to ca cast vision and to really support those who serve us through research, teaching, and service. I join you, Alice, in your commitment and your conviction. I know there are multiple contexts, there's multiple communities, there's multiple characters and nuances that we have to leverage. And at the heart of it all is our shared humanity, our unity and diversity and the human condition that we each bring. And the, and the collective that we, that we bring together and ways for us to be able to move forward with resilience together, both left of bang, right of bang, 
and during Bang. I'm going to invite people now to come forward in terms of the panel. We have an enormous gift um, in having a variety of different um, presenters with us today to speak part of their story. I have nothing but absolute humble admiration for every single one of these people who has stepped forward to share their story with us. I also have humble admiration for all of those of you here in this room that are here with us today and know that each one of us has our story, but also that these individuals have come to share with us part of theirs. So I'm going to um, pass it on to Martin um, to be able to say a few words um, and, to, and to set the stage for us as we, as we embark in a little bit of a panel discussion. Martin. Thank you. Thank you, Suzette. Please join the panel. Yeah, great. <laughs> You've given us a beautiful segue okay. to what we want to talk about next. What we thought we would do is, first of all, ask each of, each of the panel members to introduce themselves and give us a little bit of background. Um, they can do it by far better than any of us can. So we're going to ask, you, I think, Mark, if you would like to kick it off. Oh, I'm, oh, I'm sorry, you've changed order. So, yeah, kick it off anyway, Mark. We'll keep going around. Go, Mark. Yeah. My name is Mark Stevenson. I'm a Fort McMurray firefighter. I've been with Fort McMurray for 11 years. Uh, previous to that, I spent 10 years in the Canadian Armed Forces. And just keep going down that way. Oh, so, okay. uh, over to Wilson. Sure. Uh, Wilson Kwan, uh, police officer, um, also started the first response to fashion which is a fashion show that has, um, that the models are first responders and uh, business owner sponsor. We raise money for the 3MDR Cairn uh, project that we have going on. My name is Joshua Pelland. I spent several years in the British military as a Royal Marine Commando and also serving in special operations units. I uh, came back to Canada. I was always a climber and in 2016 I suffered a spinal injury due to a climbing accident. I'm now a speaker and a competitive hand cyclist. Now to Ryan. Good evening, I'm Ryan Perry. Uh, I've been in the military for 23 years. Uh, multiple tours overseas and domestic operations. And uh, I'm one of the patients of uh, Highmark and 3MDR. Hi, I'm Jenny Griffiths, and I am Ryan's partner. Um, I'm an elementary school teacher and, um, and a mom to a six-month-old little baby. A beautiful little bitty. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Suzette Bramo Phillips. I'm an associate professor in the Faculty of Rehabilitation Medicine and the director of Highmark, the Heroes in Mind Advocacy and Research Consortium, and very privileged to be here with all of you today. Thank you. So, as you've heard, our panel represent a range of different experiences and reasons that they're sitting before you today. What we're interested in starting the conversation about is the opportunity we might have going forward as a community to help future generations become resilient in the face of whatever adversity they may face, either individual or as part of a society what your advice would be as to how we prepare future generations to be more resilient and uh, more prepared to deal with the challenges of life. And when we say this, I think our thinking is primarily to face the challenges of life rather than unthinkable events specifically. And so who would like to kick off um, with a comment about that? Mark, I think Mark, it's I yours. think you were showing signs of, yeah. <laughs> you twitched. <laughs> um, for me, I think one of the key aspects of building resilience is uh, to not ignore history. Um, we need to learn from our history and build from it, uh, good or bad. We have both of them in our history as well. Um, we need to take the experience from that and, and not let the future generations uh, miss that miss that information, miss those opportunities for learning. Also, the next step, so I would think of um, compassion is a big one. Um, collection and uh, connection with other communities and other people uh, really helps um, develop an individual um, move forward. Um, we have to let our kids fail 
we have to let them fail. We have to let them fall. We have to let them get back up. And we have to enforce that, and we have to we have to encourage them to get up and try hard and move forward. That that is building resilience right there, right? Failure is something we all do. We've all learned from it, and that's that's the biggest thing to move forward from. Um, I guess I'll pause on that one. So, Matt, can, Mark, can I ask you to expand on that a little bit? And one of the things I think of when I think of history is boring. I think of 1066, having to remember dates and all of that kind of stuff. So how does the panel think we should be presenting history in a way that achieves the objective that you were describing? I don't think the actual dates of history are as important as the actual events of history. So if we take the events of history and, and, and pass that information on to our future generations, the Holocaust, 9-11, the terrorist attacks, uh, my experience, our fire in Fort McMurray that burned down half our town. We can't let that information um, just wane away. We have to let the experiences that we've all had pass that along and, and nurture that um, resilience effects after that and, and help build that in the future generations. Um, yes, is that all? Mark, would I be able to ask you, when I, when I think about something that Alice said, in terms of commemorating and, and narrative. The potency of narrative of your story and how you actually were resilient in the face of your story. And when, we, when, I, when I think about you trying to, trying to um, describe how to be resilient, I think about the strength of you and the courage of you amidst the, amidst the context that you were in within Fort McMurray. Do you think that there's a place for you telling your story that actually enables others to be more resilient by your modeling of resilience or telling them about something of your narrative that gives them a model or an image about how to go through those kinds of struggles? Yeah, I can try that. Um, for me, I was, on, uh, I was on shift the day the fire hit the town. Um, we knew things were a little smoky and a little, a little scary for us. Uh, we've had previous days fires, fringe fires around town. Um, so that morning I left for work, kissed my wife and kids goodbye as normal, you know, have a safe day. Um, that morning of the fire that actually hit the town, there was a little bit of a wind shift, so the, so the wind had shifted and took all smoke out of town, so it was a little bit of a calming effect for the town. That changed around 11 o'clock in the morning um, drastically. The, the fire jumped the river to the north side of town, um, and within half hour, we had three major fires in our town three different locations, so that that just blew up our entire department. Um, we had a hall, all call out, all industry staff coming in too. We have industry partners uh, through community um, with Suncor, Syncrude, Albion Sands, all those fire departments, they all sent everyone they could down to us as well. Um, so yeah, my resilience, um, so yeah, I told my family. Um, when, when stuff started to hit town, I, I called my wife at work and I said, listen, um, I know you're busy, but get home, get the kids, get the wife, or sorry, get, get, get the kids. <laughs> no, she is the wife, yeah. Get the, get the kids, get the nanny, get the dog, get out of town now. And like, I don't, her was, what, what's, what's going on? Like, just, I don't have time, go. Just do it, go south. Um, so for me, that knowing that she had listened to me and, and got out of town and got my family safe, enabled me to, to focus on exactly what I need to do to, to help my community and help my peers and to move forward. Um, I, I had some trials and tribulations along the whole thing as well. I happened to be in front of my house when it was on fire. I, I watched it burn. I took a little couple second video and, and sent that to my wife so she had some realization of what was actually going on. and. Um, things just exploded from there. Somehow that video ended up on Facebook and I was getting inundated with calls from CNN, ABC, whoever else I don't even know. It was just 100 Huntley Street. There's just so many people. It was, it was overwhelming. It was exciting. It was, uh, it, it showed a lot of people cared. You know, a lot of people cared about our story up there and what was going on. Um, so for me, that, that helped with my resilience and, and knowing that my family was gone able to me to focus on, on the task at hand, as I said, and, and move forward. Um, my resilience didn't really wane in that until, until after the fire was over and all the adrenaline stuff wore off and the reality of my situation set in. I, I literally owned what I was wearing on my back in the truck in the parking lot. I had nothing else to my life other than my family down in Edmonton. And that's the best part about it. They were in Edmonton safe, so... 
Do you know, Mark, thank, thank you. you. So the idea is we would like to open up questions of the panel from the audience. So if you would like to initiate part of the conversation or have questions of the panelists, please put up your hand and we will get a mic over to you right away. Um, so I'm looking, are there any questions at this point? See any, anyone, Laurie? If not, I was going to ask Ryan and Jennifer if they could give us a perspective on how they talk to their family and tell the story, in their case, to their family. And, and how, their, how their family um, interacts with you around those stories, if you could give us a perspective. Yeah, I, I think we're in an interesting predicament. We're new parents and, um, you know, we're simple people. We live in a 40-year-old bungalow. We have a rescue dog. We're just sort of like normal, normal people. Um, you know, except Ryan has you know, these traumas and PTSD and, um, you know, issues with that. And one of our biggest concerns having a child was how are we going to teach her not only resiliency, but an understanding of Ryan's um, illness, his mental illness. How is she going to grow up with that um, and not let it be a burden for her or um, a mystery? Um, because, as we all know, uh, future generations have gone off to war, come back with shell shock, and it was never to be spoken of again. And we don't want that for our daughter. We want her to grow up from, you know, infancy, understanding um, what's happening. So, Ryan, would you like anything to, to add to that? Um, in our family life, uh, I have, with, with a mental illness, I have a different, I see things differently from, uh, un, than a normal person would. Um, when our baby cries, it's not the baby's crying. My first thought is, what's wrong? There's always something wrong. So we make the joke that I'm rescue dad. The minute the baby cries, I'm up and I'm looking, what, you know, what's wrong? I don't think that'll ever go away while she's a baby till she gets to speak and when she's mobile, it'll be, you know, she trips and falls, I'll treat it like the way I was raised. You're not bleeding, get up, brush it off, you'll be all right. Um, what Jenny said about uh, previous wars, I'm a third generation engineer. My grandfather fought in the Second World War and Korea uh, my father was an engineer for 27 years, multiple tours. His last tour was Somalia in 1993. Um, they never talked about it. They talked about the good times. Like my father, he served in Germany for a long time. He talked about drinking beer and playing hockey. You know, my grandfather never ever spoke about the war, ever. Uh, hindsight being 2020, yeah, there were, he probably had some, probably had some issues. Uh, and I learned from that, and I'm try real hard not to make the mistakes that uh, they made. That's pretty well all I have to say. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. So, Alice, I wanted to ask you to talk about what we talked about at lunchtime, if you wouldn't mind, because it's a very interesting perspective in relation to what Ryan just said. So, um, you were just talking about the fact that your father never talked to you about his war experience, and. Um, that was true in my household too. My dad was also World War II vet and um, never told me anything about it. Uh, but one of the things that we s observed at the Holocaust Museum, um, we had a lot of contact with Holocaust survivors um, in the early years of creating the museum. Actually, several of the um, founders were um, survivors. And um, what we saw was a pattern where survivors uh, would tell us that they didn't talk to their children about what they had gone through. Because they, they would use words like, we didn't want to infect them with our pain. We want them to have a good life. We don't want them to know what we went through. Um, but that as time went on and they became grandparents, it would skip a generation. They would feel this tremendous urgency to tell their story to the grandchild, to the next generation. Part of that was recognition of mortality. They wanted someone to know the story. The burden fell on the next generation. 
not their child, but the next one, that there was enough distance that the child could become the carrier of the story without getting infected by it. Um, but it became a, a kind of generational obligation to tell the story and to remember it. So that was... Thank you, yeah. So Joshua, I want to change the pace a little bit in the sense in that um, you, young person, um, suffered the injury you did. What happened to the people around you in the way they then reacted to your circumstances and, and their relationship with you, your, your friends, your buddies, the people you climbed with and so on? Well, I stopped climbing with a lot of them. <laughs> My mom cried a lot. But they just left me to who I was and didn't really seem to have any change towards their relationship or mine towards them. And I'm still in contact with a lot of climbers that I've been with and friends that I've served with who are still serving. So those relationships really haven't changed at all, in a sense. I want to ask you a little bit about the empathy that occurred during that time with those people, though. So now you're in regular contact, but at the time of your accident, how do they react to you? Did they avoid discussing it? Did they engage fully with you? What, how did they express their relationship with you at that time? There really, there really was no, no change in our relationship as such. Some of them were a lot more caring. Uh, true friends stayed with me on a very emotional <laughs> level, very personal level. I had a friend who came from South Africa and he stayed with me for a month when I was in Vancouver. And that was a mark of a true friend. So seeing that, I really looked up to it and wanted, you know, be like that for the people around me. Can I ask you a question? Mm -hmm. You've been very, very active at the highest level of serving in the military and also in other, other professional roles in your life, mm -hmm. as well as going through the recovery and rehabilitation after having the injury. Would you, would you be able to tell us what kinds of things you've grown through in terms of resilience or the marks of resilience that you would offer from your lived experience, both as a professional and also through your recovery, that could inform future generations about how we might be able to inspire? One of the biggest things that helped me transition into life with a spinal injury was looking back on my past, drawing strength from fear, adversity that I'd been in, and also failures, and also looking to the people that were in my life, and mainly to the examples of courage, determination, unselfishness, and the biggest one being cheerfulness and adversity, where I just had to really look at my situation and laugh about it. I remember sitting on a physio table, like a big firm bed, and I was practicing balancing, so I'm paralyzed from the chest down and have no balance, and the physiotherapist told me to take my hands away. And I was like, no flipping way. But, I, you know, I, I really struggled to do it, you know, the fear of falling. But I really just had to laugh at myself, you know. I was scared to sit on the edge of a bed after years of climbing 1,000-foot cliffs, you know. So that, that cheerfulness and adversity is a big one. Not discarding all the pain and hurt and whatever drawing strength from it and just, you know, laughing about it in a way. So Wilson, I, I'm, I'm not sure if I'm um, picking this story up correctly, but I'm thinking that in your case, you would be exposed to what I would describe as a sort of a chronic or series of multiple incidents that would impact you. And that therefore anticipating in that in that in your career but also experiencing it in a progressive way 
you would have in some ways built some resilience in that process. Can you tell us a little bit about how that worked or am I making rash assumptions? That's, that's a big question. <laughs> um, well, I'll tell you this, um, and, and I first want to say uh, thank you to Alice um, for coming here. It's so crazy right now, and I'm just diverting from your question a little bit, but I need to pinch myself, like my hairs on the back of my neck are standing up, because five years ago when I started this whole raising money for the Glen Rose and the Karen and the 3MDR, um, when the idea popped in my head to do this and we had started, my wife and I took a trip to the 9-11 Museum. And everything that you said in that video and when you were speaking, it was unbelievable. Just watching it right now, I remember going through the museum and I recommend anybody in the audience, you gotta go, especially if you're a first responder. It is amazing, the feeling that you have inside. But I remember walking through there and many times I caught myself with tears running down my face. And I remember um, we went there for vacation and it was supposed to be a fun trip, right? And not saying that it wasn't fun, but we went to a Giants game and <laughs> became like a big Giants fan from that trip and stuff. And um, I remember after walking through that museum, I already had the idea that I wanted to raise money. I wanted to do this project where we have first responders involved, a fashion show where we can, you know, dedicate it to first responders, raise money for post-traumatic stress disorder. But walking through that museum, I remember going to the bathroom right after, um, by the gift shop, there's a bathroom there, and looking in the mirror, and um, a moment of self-reflection came in me. And I said, who am I as, what am I gonna be as a human being? And then the second was, all these people had died at this, for, on this date. And as a first responder, I was very much, what do I need to do for myself to actually honor these people? And I remember thinking about it, and I remember thinking about my project and saying, I need to have tenacity to see this through. And now to see everything that's happened here. And another thing that was actually really funny was, I remember that moment, because as soon as I walked out the door, my wife was like, I think I saw Odell Beckham Jr. And I was just like, what? <laughs> and it was just like, that, that moment was really big. But, uh, <laughs> but it's crazy that I pinch myself now, because five years after, everything that was there, and we talk about resiliency, everything that I thought about that I wanted to do has now come to fruition, and I'm here sitting across from you, and the moment that I thought about it, a part of it was because of that. So you accomplished what you wanted at that museum. Now, back to the question, I've talked so much about that, but, but back to the question on resiliency. One of the reasons I think it's important to, that I do what I did and to have that as a first responder, I remember um, I played a lot of sports growing up and I had a lot of friends, uh, played football, uh, up to university and many of those guys I played with became uh, a first responder. Many of them, I know one of them's here, Troy, he was here. Uh, a lot of them became firemen, EMS or police officers and several years into it I noticed that they were completely different. They were no longer the same guy, the same jovial person that I knew before they became a first responder. And I'd always wondered to myself, oh my God, you know, these guys, they're, it was almost like they were zombies. I'm not saying all of them, but many of them, because of everything that they had seen, they had become such pessimists about life. They had become so, so strange to it and me coming from, my family always had private businesses. Um, my wife and I come from a background of private businesses. When I would sit down and negotiate a deal with somebody, I had to believe that that person was doing, their intention was to be a positive intention. Hey, we both want to get a positive deal in, in the outcome of our business. But in the first responder world, that very seldom happens. 
it's you show up and it's a negative interaction no matter what especially as a police officer like as a fireman when people call the fire department <laughs> they want the fire department there right like you know they they're like my house is you know i mean you're you're kind of like my house is burning down we need you here but as a police officer ems it's just like sometimes they don't want you there right like 50% of the time, the people are like, I don't want you here. And it's, it's hard. You see horrific things or the general public just don't like you, right? 50% of the population are just like, we, we don't want you here. We hate you. And so it's hard to deal with. So one of the things when I came up with this idea, I wanted my coworkers, I wanted my friends to know what it was like to see the people that they never deal with because our show has all these business owners that show up who never call the police. But they sit there and say, I don't ever want to call the police and I don't want to ever have to deal with what you have to deal with. Thank you for doing that. But the first responders, that they don't see that. They don't see that side of the world, that all these people are grateful for what they do. And so one of the th things that when we talk about resiliency is, and you touched on it too, is talking to those people or getting involved and meeting those people who aren't in your world. Get out of your box. Go see those other people. There's a whole other world out there that you need to be a part of. And for whatever you're dealing with in your head, whatever it is, you have to see that other side. Thank you. Questions? Okay, so the Karen system, after. <laughs> uh, I can say the experience uh, with the Karen system. Could you just say what it is? Uh, some people I don't think know what the Karen system so is. So if you wouldn't. imagine a screen this big, but it wraps around. So it's 180 degrees around you. Then you're on a platform, and it's like a big treadmill. And you're harnessed in for safety reasons. <laughs> That's just so they can keep you there. <laughs> and uh, so it's, it, it, yeah, you're walking towards images that you know cause you issues, right? So a triggering image. And for, it could be f different images for each person. So, the great thing about it, it's very routine, it's very structured. You know what's gonna happen because you pick the pictures. The facilitator will always ask you the exact same questions. It's never a shock. So it provides a desensit desensitization to those triggering images and the events around that image you picked. Well, the ex <laughs> well, like I said, the Wilson at the first in fashion. You know, six months prior to that, I wouldn't have been in that room giving a speech. I would have been like running down the road, literally. Uh, uh, talk therapy didn't work for me. It just it didn't. Um, I, I I'm very grateful I was introduced to 3MDR because it was, it was very effective for me. Uh, it took the trauma that was sitting at the front of my brain that I could never process and turned it into a memory. So, it's, the trauma's not there anymore. Yeah, it's a memory. Yeah, it's not a great one. But everybody has negative memories in their life. But it doesn't cause you to react. And that's what 3MDR and the Karen system did, and that's what it's designed to do. Yeah, go, go for it, man. Um, how do you pinpoint your triggers? What if you can't pinpoint your triggers? How does that work with the system? Well, I can, I can say with 100% certainty that the staff will help you along. 
<laughs> Thanks, Ryan. If I can just share some thoughts. Yeah. So I had the privilege of watching Ryan go through the interventions that he's gone through with 3MDR. And I can tell you that what I've seen transformatively in Ryan has been remarkable. Um, it broke, um, it, it was beyond my expectation. I was skeptical about how effective 3MDR would be. So it really utilizes virtual reality to be able to enable someone to step into the trauma um, in a supportive environment. So there's a combination of exposure therapy combined with supportive counsel, combined with connection with one's body and with one's emotions, with the triggering event, as well as a component of EMDR, so that it enables the memories to be put back to rest. Within six weeks of one, six one-hour sessions, Ryan was, um, had gone from when I had first met Ryan um, he hadn't. He had been holed up in his house, um, not being able to engage in in the world. Um, when I first met Ryan, he came up to me and said, "I'm going to be with you on 3MDR," and um, and I haven't been able to do much. After three weeks of three sessions, um, Ryan was out in his garage for three to five hours, you um, know, in, in a day. Um, graduating up to more and more function, sleeping better, engaging better. He would talk about about Jennifer and he and not being able to walk on eggshells as much. I had the privilege of watching Ryan and Jenny when they had their baby was five weeks old. And at first, the connection wasn't there in the same way that Ryan had described him wanting that connection. I saw him six weeks later, and then eight weeks later, and then 12 weeks later, and I can tell you that the bonds that these two have with their little one are profound. There is such connection and attachment that is absolutely heartwarming. Ryan had wanted and expressed the desire to be the most connected father that he could be, and one of the triggers that he also had was caring for little ones, especially little girls. And I saw this wonderful man and, and Jenny be able to embrace their daughter in a way that is so attuned and so responsive and connected that it is absolutely incredible. Sleep changed, communication changed, concentration came, changed, avoidance changed, and Ryan can speak to that. <laughs> yeah. Um, so there is a profound difference in ways that I had not anticipated. I'm going to pass it over to Jenny, and Jenny will be able to tell you a little bit more about what she saw in, in uh, Ryan in terms of the change. Yeah, you know, um, it's interesting because I come from the perspective of a healthy person. Um, I don't understand a lot of what Ryan goes through. Of course, he shares stories with me, but, you know, simple things like a lack of motivation, I don't get, like, I don't understand that. Since working with Suzette and the team, um, he's been motivated to go work on his car. He's been motivated to, you know, put away the dishes. Simple life <laughs> skills um, that, you know, seem trivial, but are really huge when you're dealing with um, depression and PTSD and that kind of thing. It's, you know, just getting up and being able to to tend to our daughter and to be able to get up and make breakfast. Like these are all just basic, basic things that I think someone from a healthy perspective takes for granted. Um, but when you're struggling, those slip and slide away. So um, that's been huge in our family and, um, you know, just simple life skills. That's, you know, that's the goal, to live a normal, simple life um, and a happy life, so. Yeah. This man went from being afraid of being the Incredible Hulk, crippled by anger, to being able to manage it and to be in control of his emotions in a way rather than it being in control of him. Would that be fair? Yep. Yeah. Anything, now that we've spoken on your behalf, would you like to <laughs> share anything? <laughs> Any final words? No, no, we're good. Okay. So I would like to say one little thing, um, and that is that you may or may not know that there are two Karen systems in... Canada, one in Edmonton, one in Ottawa. And the one in Edmonton is by virtue of the very hard work of a number of people who are actually in the audience today. Absolutely. And so Isabel Henderson, right here, I would like to call her the CEO Emeritus 
of the Glen Rose Rehabilitation Hospital. So please stand up, uh, Isabel, because you're responsible. And, and her colleagues who include Jim Rasso. I, I saw Jim somewhere around. Where are you, Jim? No, he was with us at lunchtime. So uh, Jim Rasso also him. was a yeah. significant contributor to bringing this very sophisticated system to Edmonton. And I think we learned at lunchtime that Edmonton is a healing place. And I cannot think of a more appropriate place to have a Karen system than Edmonton. Yeah. And so uh, thank you, Isabel, and your team and the Glen Rose um, community that has really enabled that to happen. That was very much a community effort with donations from the community as well as uh, federal funding that we received to, to put that in place. So I think we are pretty close to um, the end of time available for the panel. If there's any one more pressing question, please put your hand up. If not, no, I don't think there is. If, if not, I, I'm going to pass it to <laughs> Suzette. Are you going to say something on behalf of the panel or something on behalf of on the On behalf faculty? of me. On behalf of you. Go ahead then. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to highlight some of the things that I heard from all of you in terms of um, the examples of what we can offer, what you offer through your experience of, of going through struggle and what you've, what you've communicated it, to me anyway, in terms of building the next generation and building a community that's resilient. One of the things that I've heard from each of you is um, being a model and drawing on models of resilience. People that you aspire to or people that you used as role models to be able to um, cling on to or to look to, to be able to know how to be resilient um, in those times and to be able to stand in your struggle and connect with other people. So be that you and you and uh, your family connecting, or or Mark, you and yours connecting, or Wilson, you connecting with your partner, um, you connecting with yours and your family and all those that are important to you, and looking to them for strength, and also knowing that they're safe and they're connected, they're okay. And then being able with that to be released to be able to do your job and what you have to do in terms of either your rehab or your service or your, what, what task is yours to do. There's something about being able to have skills and support around you. So being able to know that there's a team behind you. So Wilson, when you talk about the, the pe people who are on your team, um, or Mark, when you talked about going back and looking at um, facing the fires and being able to, to lean into your team and knowing that you had a task to do no matter what was before you. So there's something about connection and teamwork, and putting aside everything and suspending what struggle you're facing until later when you have time to actually deal with it. And then having the support around you, um, and I think of you, um, Ryan, in terms of having support around you and skills that are personalized or tools that are in your toolbox that are personalized to you and to you and to you and to you. Um, to be able to know that there are supports and services that we can as a community create to make sure that there's a holding place for you to be able to receive the personalized care that is needed. To have the hope and the vision, um, and Ryan, you've given me that, in terms of that word of hope, that something about having those supports and services can give you a new vision going forward, and to be able to rekindle that which is the leader that you are. There's something in leadership that I've heard from each one of you about you being the professionals and the leaders who you are to, to offer transformative change going forward. There's something about the character that you bring um, in terms of the service that you've provided, but also the, the character and the confidence that you bring going forward to change your world and to make a difference going forward. There's something about all those pieces that collectively we can aim for a common goal to change something of the culture, to be able to make it appropriate for us to look at what happens to those who serve and have served in the families that support them, to be able to change culture and vision forward, to make a difference in the, in the world going forward, to know that mental health is not something that should be hidden and forgotten, but that needs to be in the light so that we can collectively work on it together and be supports for one another going forward. I'm wondering, Jenny, if you have any other further things to add before we pass it over to Martin. No, I, I, I definitely agree that that's 
so crucial that um, we need to teach, I need to teach my students as a teacher and um, our children um, that there doesn't have to be a mystery around ment mental illness and that, you know, that I hope one day Sammy can say to her friends, you know, my dad broke his leg, my dad has PTSD. Like it's comparable, you know, it's not going to be, there's not going to be that stigma, so. Yeah, thank you. Well, I wanted to thank our panelists very much for a fascinating conversation and, and for being so open about your experiences and your approach to resilience. So I think on behalf of us all, thank you so much. Now, working, working with Suzette, it's a little bit like improv at times. Um, and so what is so wonderful about that, however, is that Suzette always finds time to really get the richness from any conversation or any situation. And, and I think I really wanted to say how much I appreciated the comments that you made this evening and, and how you brought things together and brought context to what we were talking about. And um, at the end of the day, I think tied up everything very nicely. So thank you very much, Suzette. Um, that was a wonderful summary that you gave us just now. We're now going to move on to a gift pre presentation to Alice. So Alice, if you'd like to come up, and I'm going to hand you over to Suzette. Alice, thank you for your authenticity. I think that's the deepest word that I have for you. Thank you for making the trip here and for sharing with us your experience, your wisdom, your insight, your wisdom, and your vision going forward for us. So on behalf of the university and on behalf of the faculty, on behalf of Highmark, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Okay, I have to make a few concluding remarks and I'm going to pass your script Thank over you. so I don't read your script Thank you. and that script. Great. And the other script. <laughs> <laughs> so this evening, ooh, I have to watch my mics. Is one live? Yeah, that's good. So this evening, we've heard firsthand, firsthand how people bounce back when the unthinkable happens. We've heard that although our attention may be drawn to these events, whether they affect society, and a generation as a whole, such as 9-11, or events that deeply affect individuals, there are also the stresses of everyday life that challenge our capacity to cope. Although we've started to recognize the importance of providing quality mental health services, our understanding of how to develop resilience to manage these stresses has a long way to go. Earlier today, we held a third thought leaders lunch. That's the lunch I kept talking about all the way through at City Hall. And the mayor spent an hour with us in this conversation to discuss how we as a city could develop a deeper understanding for how best to develop resilience in young people as they transition from school to university and from university to the workplace. And our group of experts recommended some outstanding ideas that we're going to make available more widely through the Highmark website in the next couple of weeks. I'd like to, ha however, highlight a few, if you like, um, immediate reactions and impressions that we had from that conversation. These are some of the recommendations that were made by this remarkably diverse and informed group of thought leaders. First of all, we'd like to prioritize ways to increase resilience through the school curriculum. And I think they would like to work on making some specific recommendations as to how that might be accomplished. Secondly, they would like us to recognize that the post-secondary system is falling short in providing the proactive support necessary for students facing a wide range of challenges, whether they be economic due to international integration or many of the other factors that affect young people as they go into university life. And that companies could provide some well, could, be, could benefit from some practical advice on how to support their employees. So these are initial reactions. And one of the things we asked the thought leaders to come forward with, just as the fire alarm went off, was a call for action. And we asked them to um, give some consideration to this and um, to share and establish some practical ways to provide diverse communities um, that uh, that the community membership is supported through some practical advice. And so their, their feeling was that one of the secrets to achieving resilience is through 
the building of communities and the way communities support each other, but learning from the diversity across multiple communities. And they would like to see how we could shape Edmonton as a leader in creating that kind of community resilience. And we think we have the ingredients in Edmonton to do that because we have the, the diversity, the high quality education, the deep understanding of each other, a strong sense of community, and I think a strong sense of purpose. So those were some of the considerations that our thought leaders came forward with. And so um, we are committed to uh, moving to the next steps and, and uh, putting those on paper and enabling them to receive wider comment. So Suzette said, without the ongoing partnership and support of a great number of individuals and organizations, Highmark would not exist or have the impact that it does have. So if you'd like more information or would like to become part of this transformative initiative, then that can be found on the handout that we've left for you at your seats or at our website. So thank you very much for coming this evening. Thank you very much for your interest in enhancing the quality of life and care for those people that serve us. So we'd like now to, to uh, invite you to a reception that we're going to be holding, which is just outside on the right-hand side. And we wish you all well, safe travel home, and thank you so much for participating this evening. Before we leave, I also want to take a moment to thank Martin and Peggy Ferguson Pell for their incredible support for this event, and Martin for being the MC today, um, this afternoon at lunch, and also this evening. Also, want to thank the Royal um, the Royal Alberta Museum for hosting us um, and making this event possible. The Royal Canadian Legion has been profoundly supportive of Highmark, um, as has the Canadian Armed Forces, and thank you for the representation that you have here. Um, so thank you all for being here. We appreciate it and please enjoy. So thank you, Martin. Okay, thank you. Thank you.